Who invented music? Music is just about as old as humanity itself, and maybe even older. <coughs> the very first musical instrument was most likely the human voice, which is full of musical sounds like singing, humming, clicking, and whistling. Over the years, Archaeologists have dug up a few ancient instruments, like flutes, made of swan or mammoth bones that are around 30,000 years old. The absolute oldest known instrument is called the Divje Bave flute, which was uncovered in Slovenia in 1995. The flute is carved out of a cave bear femur and has four holes, enough to play a full musical scale. The flute is anywhere between 50,000 and 60,000 years old. It's so old, in fact, that it was even carved by a completely different species of human. That's right, the Dipje Bobby flute is the only instrument ever uncovered that was made by Neanderthals. The oldest known song isn't nearly as old as the first instruments. It's only about 3,500 years old and was written in an ancient language called cuneiform. The song is called Hurian Hymn No. 6, and while there were certainly songs written down before it, it's the oldest song to survive until today. The hymn is written on clay tablets and even includes specific instructions for how to play the song on the lyre, a nine-stringed guitar-like instrument. Ever since, music has grown and changed and blossomed into an indelible part of life. Who invented wheelchairs? No one can say for sure when the very first wheelchair was made, but we do know that they've been around for a pretty long time. The oldest known wheeled furniture comes from a stone engraving on an ancient Chinese tablet that's more than 2,500 years old. This ancient version of a wheelchair was basically a wheelbarrow that was refitted to carry someone around. Not ideal, but people used what they had access to. It was another thousand years or so before wheeled seats made specifically to carry people with disabilities around started to show up in Chinese art. The only problem was these chairs still needed to be pushed by someone else. Over in Europe, there weren't many options all the way up until the late 1500s when a similar design to the ancient Chinese version was finally developed and only because the King of Spain needed one. It was a chair truly fit for a king, with elaborate armrests, footrests, plush cushions, and gold accents. It basically looked like a giant lounge chair with wheels to push him around like, well, a king. So, this invention was a lot more like a portable throne than a modern-day self-propelling wheelchair. Those finally came along about 50 years later in 1655. That was the year a 22-year-old German watchmaker named Stefan Farfler built the world's first self-propelling wheelchair. His design was intense, almost like an oversized boxcar with three wheels like a tricycle. The person in the chair would move themselves with a series of cranks, cogs, levers, and gears that were turned like bike pedals to make the device move. Around the mid-1700s, the bath chair was popularized, which was very similar to Farfler's original design, just smaller and less boxy looking. Throughout the 1800s, several improvements made these newfangled wheelchairs even better, like rear push wheels and casters, which are wheels that can swivel like on a shopping cart. Eventually, hollow rubber wheels were added, then push rims a few years later. Push rims are metal rings attached to the chair that help make it much easier to push. In 1932, a sleeker steel version of the wheelchair was invented, which was foldable and more lightweight. In the mid-50s, a mass-produced electric wheelchair finally hit the market. Nowadays, inventors around the world are working to come up with cutting-edge ways to give wheelchairs more state-of-the-art technology. Today, doctors can even implant a device that allows patients to move their chairs around just by thinking. And who knows what other breakthroughs will come in the next 30 years. Who invented books? The very first forms of writing date back almost 6,000 years ago to an ancient people called the Sumerians 
who started etching in their early alphabet into moist clay tablets using a triangular tool called a calamus. The clay was then fired in a kiln to harden. This new ability, writing things down, proved to be popular. And for the next thousand or so years, tablets were the only good way to do it. That's until papyrus scrolls came along. The oldest known scrolls date back to ancient Egypt, almost 4,500 years ago. Papyrus is a thick material made from thin strands of papyrus plant stem glued together that's more like a fabric than a paper. This was an upgrade from the heavy clay tablets, but scrolls still weren't simple. They were usually between 10 and 50 feet long and usually took two hands to use because they were so heavy. The papyrus would also crack easily, but before long, the Romans had a solution. They created the codex, which sounds like a secret gadget, but is just a series of scrolls that were bound together and opened like a book. The wooden covers protected the pages, which were now made from a material called parchment made from animal skins. Over in China, the earliest books were made of thin pieces of bamboo bound together with hemp, silk, or leather. Sometime between 618 and 907, the very first books were printed in China. They were made using a time-consuming method called woodblock printing, where the words are carved into wood and stamped onto pages. In the 1040s, a Chinese man named Bi Zheng invented movable type printing, which used pre-made character blocks made of ceramic or clay. This design would later be improved on by Johannes Gutenberg, who invented the printing press. This changed everything, because for the first time, books were mass-produced quickly. Before the printing press, people only copied a couple pages per day, but now thousands of pages could be produced. That means that books and the incredible knowledge they can contain became available for more and more people at cheaper and cheaper prices. Today, books are all made from using the same basic process. The words are printed on big sheets of paper, which are cut into smaller pages, double the length of a book. Those pages are then folded in half and sewn together. Finally, the sewn and folded pages are cut to final size and glued to the spine of the book's cover. Today, what we think of as a book is always changing. Ebooks, audiobooks, and other digital readers are becoming a bigger and bigger part of daily life. But most experts agree that physical bound books will never go away completely. Who invented fast food? Like many of the greatest inventions, no one person invented fast food by themselves. The very earliest versions of fast food could be found all around the ancient world. Most average Romans lived in apartment buildings without full-fledged kitchens and would mostly rely on vendors and ready-made meals. Almost a thousand years ago, people in China would buy snacks from vendors like fried dough, soup, or stuffed buns, all of which are eaten to this day. During the Middle Ages, regular people living in big cities like London and Paris mostly ate food they bought from vendors or storefronts. Pies, waffles, pastries, cookies, pancakes, and cooked meats. But the modern fast food industry we see today really began in the United Kingdom in the mid-1800s. That's when the British favorite fish and chips was invented. You see, fish and chips were a convenient, cheap, easy-to-make snack that became an everyday meal among the working class of England. By 1920, there were over 35,000 fish and chip shops across the UK. And in 1928, the very first fish and chip fast food chain restaurant opened its doors. Around the same time in the United States, the burger joint White Castle was founded in Wichita, Kansas. It's generally considered the second fast food chain and the first hamburger chain. White Castle was super successful from day one and led to a ton of competitors. 
You've probably heard of some of those competitors, because the fast food industry took off from there, spawning dozens of hyper-successful fast food chains that operate in more than 100 countries across the world. So that's how fast food was invented. Now, whether or not it's healthy for you, that's a whole other question entirely. Who invented basketball? Unlike most other popular pro sports today, basketball can actually trace its origin back to one single person, a guy named James Naismith. Back in 1891, Mr. Naismith was fresh out of college and working as a gym teacher at a local YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts. That winter was particularly cold and snowy, so his class was stuck inside for gym every day for months. And over time, the kids began to get rowdier and rowdier. So James Naismith's boss gave him a project. Try and solve the problem by inventing a brand new game the kids can play indoors to help them drain all that pent up energy. Naismith was given just two weeks to invent his game and was given a few guidelines. The game couldn't take up too much space, it couldn't be too rough, and it had to help keep the school's track athletes in shape. So James Naismith started devising his brand new sport from scratch, and he began with the ball. He decided a hard ball like a baseball or golf ball was too dangerous, so he modeled it on a soft soccer ball instead. Next, he raised the goal well above the players' heads. This forced them to softly lob the ball into the goal instead of hurling it, which took skill and was safer. Naismith decided to call his new sport basketball because he fashioned the goals out of old beach baskets. According to Naismith, most of the fouls called in the first game were for running with the ball or for tackling an opponent. After every single score, the game would pause while someone fished the ball out of the basket with a ladder and the ball would be tipped off at the center of the court. The first rules also didn't include the dribble. The only way a player could move the ball up the court was by passing. So players quickly invented a strategy of passing to themselves by tossing the ball in the air while they run around. By 1905, the original peach basket design was replaced with the nets we know today. Other innovations, like the shot clock, the slam dunk, and the three-pointer have all helped turn basketball into the mega popular sport we love today. So the next time your favorite player knocks down a game-winning three, you can thank James Naismith for his snowed-in stroke of genius. Who invented Braille? It turns out the Braille writing system was invented by a guy named well, Braille. Louis Braille, that is, a Frenchman who had a bad accident at the age of three that left him blind. Back in those days, there weren't many resources to help people with blindness, but Louis Braille still excelled as a student. At 10 years old, he won a scholarship to a state-of-the-art school in Paris called the Royal Institution for Blind Youth. It was one of the very first schools in the world for the blind, and Louis flourished in his years there. He learned through oral lessons and would read books that the school's founder had customized so the letters were raised on the page. This helped him and other students read, but it could sometimes be hard to tell certain letters apart. Somewhere along the line, Louis decided he was going to try and devise a system that would let people with blindness do both. He finally got his spark of inspiration when he learned about a former French army captain named Charles Barbier, who invented a system called night writing. Soldiers used it to pass coded messages around in the cover of darkness without needing to speak or spark a light. Messages were written out in a code of raised dots and dashes that were pressed into the paper. So he went about adapting Barbier's system for the blind. In Braille, each letter of the alphabet is represented by a different pattern of raised dots, which were easy to tell apart even with just a fingertip. Braille's new system was ready to show off, and in 1824, he did just that. At just 15 years old, Braille presented his new system to his peers. And just five years later, he published the first ever book on Braille. The second revision was published eight years later and included symbols for math and music too. Louis, 
who had always been in fairly poor health, died young at the age of 43. Braille never got to live to see his namesake spread across the world. His home nation of France first recognized the Braille system two years after his death. Today, the Braille system is the standard form of reading and writing used by people with visual impairments in all corners of the globe. It's been adapted to different languages and scripts so that just about any language can be translated into Braille. Nice! Who invented football? People first started playing American football in the mid-1800s at colleges and universities in the U.S. and Canada. The very first official college football game took place on November 6, 1869 between Princeton and Rutgers. But the game and its rules looked a lot more like rugby in those days. There were no downs, line of scrimmage, and no forward passing whatsoever. Over the next few decades, the sport and its rules continued to slowly evolve. A man by the name of Walter Camp, a former collegiate football player at Yale, is considered to be the father of American football for helping to implement many changes that turned the game into the sport we recognize today. Things like the point system, snapping the ball, having four downs, and even the standard arrangement of the players on the field were all his idea. By the 1880s, athletic clubs were becoming extremely popular all across the country. Athletic clubs were groups of people that got together to play different sports as a team, kind of like an adult little league team. The more popular these athletic clubs became, the more competitive the games got. And over time, competition got fierce as each club tried to attract the best players. Some clubs would help star players get jobs or give them expensive gifts. But since all players were supposed to be amateurs, this was frowned upon and considered cheating by many. And it all came to a head over a hundred years ago on November 12, 1892, when one team finally took it one step too far. AAA and PAC were two athletic clubs from the Pittsburgh area that were already bitter rivals. So when their November showdown rolled around that year, both teams were ready to pull out all the stops to get the win. For AAA, that meant taking a truly unprecedented step of paying a star player from another team to come play for them in the big game. This made a man by the name of William Pudge Heffelfinger the very first verifiable person to ever be paid to play football. The two teams debated, argued, and bickered about the move, but eventually decided to play the game. Triple A won, with Heffelfinger scoring the only points. Nowadays, the NFL is America's most popular pro sports league by a long shot and continues to grow. And we can all thank a bitter rivalry in Pittsburgh for getting it all started. 